and welcome to chapter nine. In chapter nine, we're gonna add some more array concepts. So we did chapter eight was arrays. In chapter nine, we're gonna introduce sorting algorithms and array lists and enumerations and a couple of new things in arrays. Let's get started. First thing we're gonna talk about is how to sort your array elements. So we're gonna go through two different types of sorting algorithms. There's many more than two just to let you know. But we're only going to cover two different types of sorting right now. We're going to cover bubble sorting and insertion sorting. So starting with bubble sort. Bubble sort is one of the more common sorting algorithms. The way we do bubble sort is if you look at a list, we're going to look through the list two items at a time. So imagine that you have a deck of cards in your hand. Take an unsorted deck face down on the right hand side. We're going to do this multiple times. So there's going to be some repeating going on, but essentially we're going to look through the list. So we're going to pull two items out and I'm going to have one in my left hand and one in my right hand. If the number in my left hand is bigger than the number of my right hand, switch cards. Then put down the one that's in my left hand and pick up a new card, swap them over. Depending on which one's bigger, we're going to switch those again. If they're not bigger, we're going to put down the one in our left hand, pick up the one in the right hand. Keep going. We're going to keep doing this and then we're going to get to the end. Then we're going to take the entire deck, flip it back over, and do it again. We're going to keep repeating this until we never make a switch. So the theory in bubble sort is that you will bubble the largest number to the bottom or to the top, depending on which direction you're looking at your list. But we're going to bubble the entire, um, the largest item to the left or to the right, to the end. And then we're going to do it again. And then the next largest number and then the next largest number until you get all the way through the list. The basic algorithm for this is written in the to the side in pseudocode. We're going to do a repeat, some sort of a loop, usually a for loop, multiple times. Put the right top card of the right hand pile into your hand. Repeat until there's no more cards. If the top card in your hand and the top card of the pile need to be switched, Go ahead and switch them. Otherwise, place your hand card on the left hand pile and pick up another card. Keep flipping. We're going to keep doing this multiple times. I'm going to actually show you the code for this and we're going to walk through an example with some visuals. This algorithm has two nested loops and a single decision. So two repeats and an if. The largest item is always going to bubble at the end. And when we talk about what big O notation, which is how efficient is it? This is an n squared time um, sorting algorithm. It actually takes two t or um, um, n squared where n is the length of cards that you have, which is really kind of inefficient. If you want to change it to descending, you just flip the, cons the, the comparison from greater than to less than and it goes the other direction. When we talk about big O notation, we're going to do a little bit more with that um, in a couple of slides, just explaining how we how we um, divide sorting algorithms into different um, examples and which ones are more efficient. It really kind of depends on which type of, of data set you have and how sorted it already is. So let's go look at some code on how to build bubble sort in Java and we'll look at some code on what it looks like visually. This is one of my favorite sites for visualizing sorting arrays. So we are going to go to its visual algo or aljo or however you want to pronounce it. I call it visual go because that's how I see it. Um, but it's just visualgo.net. We're going to go ahead and select the sorting option. Um, I'm going to go ahead and cancel out of the choices. So we have a couple of different sorting choices we can pick from. Bubble sort I'm going to show you and insertion sort. So for bubble sort, when you click the bubble sort, you can choose to create a new array. We can use random numbers. So you can see I can click random and it'll just pick random numbers for me. And then I can tell it to go. Now the nice thing about this is that it does show me some algorithm information as we're going along. So if I tell him to go and tell him to sort, he is going to tell me my method here that he's going to do. He's going to check through and figure out if they're swapped. If there's any swapping, then we know we need to do it again. So as long as swapping is true, that means we need to keep going. And you see we bubbled that one all the way up to the end. You can change your sorting speed here to go a little bit faster. So we can see those a little bit faster. 
and you can see how each number is getting sorted to the end. Once we know they're sorted, they'll turn orange. That last one is sorted now. And you can see they, they're pretty sure those are all in space. Those are good. We're going to keep going until we can check to make sure. Now when we go through and we get to the point that there is no more sorting, then we're done. So you notice it just finished because we finished all of our sorting. So visualizing how bubble sort works is a really important part of understanding programming, understanding the sort, sorting algorithm. Even if we could create a method or we could use a pre-created method to do our sorting, it's still really important for you to understand the methodology behind bubble sort. We're going to go ahead and start with the bubble sort demo um, on page 423. So let's see here. We're going to start with our bubble sort demo class. And once we have our main in place, we're going to go ahead and make a couple of variables that we're going to be using throughout. So first we're going to make our integer array because we're going to be putting in some integers in here. We're going to call this sum nums. Um, and it's going to be a new integer array. We're going to set it equal to just five, just for the purposes of testing and show you how this is done. We're also going to make how many comparisons are we going to make? And we're going to be using this to make our um, bubble sort a little bit more efficient. And we're going to set it equal to sum nums length minus one. So we're going to set it equal to minus one to start with, and then we will modify it as we go along. We're going to use our scanner to have the user enter in some information. And we'll make sure we add that scanner into our um, library. So let's import that scanner. Perfect. And next we're going to make a um, and a couple of integers that we're going to play with. So a, b, and temp. And we can, um, these will all default to um, zero because we haven't given them a value. Okay, so now we have our variables. Let's go ahead and start our forced for loop that's going to prompt the user to enter each value into the array. So we're just going to do our system, our for a equals zero, a is less, a is less than, some nums length, because we want to do the length, get it all filled up, and we'll a plus plus. Okay. We can now ask the user, what do you want to put your next number in? So we can do our system out and say, um, enter number space. And we're going to put a plus one because we're going to tell the user we're starting at one, even though obviously we're starting at zero because we're zero based. And let's just make that a regular print instead of a print ln so that we can have that space. And then the user will go ahead and enter in our next value. Input next int. Semicolon. So the user is going to be able to enter in the values that we have and we can put in those five values. So we'll walk through and say what are the five values that we want. Let's go ahead and um, call a method that displays our um, array. So we'll set display some nums. We haven't written it yet. We're going to. It's okay. We'll get to it. Um, in fact, just to keep us, I'm going to jump a little bit and we're going to jump over and build that display now and then we'll come back and keep working. So I'm going to do a public static void display and I'm going to pass in an int array of some numbers. And I'm going to give it an A, which is just going to be, nothing. I don't know why I'm giving it an A. Oh, because I'm going to say which iteration it is. So. Pardon me. So now we're going to print out iteration 
and we'll print out our A. We'll go ahead and do that as um, a regular print method. And then after that, we will go ahead and enter in our each of our numbers that exists in our list. So four and I equals zero. I is less than some nums length I plus plus. And we're going to go ahead and enter in for each of those sys out. We'll make it a print instead of a print ln. And then we will just do our sum nums and a space. And a space. So then we'll go through and print all of those. And finally, we will end with a um, new line. So we'll go ahead and do a new line. Okay, so that's our display method. So up here, our display method. Um, needs which iteration we're going to do and we're going to say iteration zero to tell us that that was the first one that we're doing okay so now we've jumped from step four to step six and now we'll jump back to step five in step five we're actually going to implement our bubble sort so we have built our array so up here we have our couple of methods or a couple of uh, variables here we have built our array here we have printed our array the first time let's go ahead and build our bubble sort so in our bubble sort, we are going to say for a equals zero, a is less than some nums length, a plus plus. Okay, so this is the first iteration of our bubble sort. When we go through our bubble sort, remember we start with the first iteration, and then we immediately go to the interior nested loop. So we're going to do a second for b equals zero. In this case, we're only going to do our B is less than our comparison to make. And then we're going to increment our B. So right now, our comparisons to make is one less. What's going to happen with bubble sort, remember, is that we're going to fill up to the end. So we don't have to compare that last number anymore because we already know that it's the right number. Now we're going to do our comparison. If our sum nums A, I'm sorry, B, excuse me, um, is greater than some nums b plus one okay so if i'm looking at two cards and one card the the one in my left hand hand side is bigger than the one in my right i need to flip them so now we're going to use our temp variable equals some nums b We're going to set our sum nums b equal to our sum nums b plus 1. And then we will set our sum nums b plus 1 equal to our temp value. So all we've done now at this point is we flipped. So whichever card was in b, we're, we're going to switch it with one that was in b plus 1. Once we've done that, we can go ahead and display our new um, list when we have finished walking through all of our list. So we're going to say display, we're going to pass some nums, and we are going to say it's iteration A. Um, actually, we're going to do A plus 1 because A is going to be 0 at this point. So we're going to say iteration 1, this is what it looks like. Then we are going to decrement our comparison to make. Sorry. And we're going to decrement that. Let's make sure we get rid of this extra board that's sitting at the top. Okay. What that does is it means we've already pushed at least one to the end. We don't need to look at the end anymore because we've gone as far as we need to. The next time around, we'll know we've pushed two to the end. And so on and so forth. Okay. Finally, when we finish everything, it should print out all the values that we need. Um, don't forget to close our input at the end. And we'll go ahead and run that. So we're cleared. Let's go ahead and run. All right, it's gonna say, what are your first number? I'm gonna go with 45. 62, 31, 
18 and 22. Those are going to be my five numbers. They're obviously not in order because the point is to put them in order. And you can see it's going to start with iteration 0. I need to put a space in there. 45, 62, 31, 18, 22. Okay. Iteration 1, we're going to take that 62 and we bubbled it all the way to the end. So 62 is now the last number. Everything else has kind of moved around a little bit, but not significantly. Um, then we can do our iteration 1 to 2, where we're going to take the number 45 and bubble that to the end. Iteration 3 is going to take our 31, bubble it to the end. Iteration 4 is going to take our 22, and iteration 5 is going to put our 18. Let me go ahead and put that space in there, because I don't like the way that iteration did without a space. And let's go ahead and run it one more time just to show you with it being a little bit cleaner. So 85, 25, 41, 37, and 15. And you can see our 85, our largest number, got bubbled to the top. After the 85, our next largest number, which is 41, got bubbled to the top. Then 37, then 25, and finally 15 and we've sorted out our array. Now that you have a pretty good idea of what bubble sort looks like, we're gonna switch gears and move on to insertion sort. Insertion sort is a little bit different. An insertion sort is going to look at two items, it's the same way the bubble sort did, and if the items are currently sorted, it leaves them alone. Otherwise, if they're out of sort, then we're gonna insert the right item into the correct place in the previously sorted group. So if we start from the very beginning, look at just the first two items. Are they sorted correctly? If they are, move on and look at the first and or the, the index one and index two items. So the second and third items, are those correct? Otherwise, you need to move it down until it gets into the right place. We're going to keep doing this over and over and over again until we get to the end. This algorithm has two nested loops and is also big O notation of n squared efficiency. We're going to look at some code of how to build insertion sort using some of the previous code we just did in bubble sort and writing some code of our own. And we're going to look at a visualization of insertion sort so that you can visualize what is going on when you make those changes. At this point, I'm going to switch over to insertion sort. Insertion sort, again, is a little bit different. We're going to go ahead and create a random list. Let's make it a little bit short. There we go. Random list here and I'm going to tell the sorting to go. Now remember with insertion sort, we're going to pull a number out and put it in its correct location. So you can see we're pulling a number out and putting it where it belongs. So each time you pull it out, put it over there, we're going to pull it out and insert it where it belongs. Finally, we're done. So the method behind insertion sort, a little bit different than bubble sort. We're going to go ahead and do one more just to show you again how that works. Start from the first position, or the second position actually, and move it around as long as it needs to move back from where it is. So we're going to look at the numbers. In this case, we pulled out a 1 and it goes all the way to the front. Pull out an 18, it goes there, 26, and we are done. So you can see how insertion sort is able to use that algorithm to figure it out. What I like about this is it also gives you a algorithm to follow. This doesn't have to be in Java. This doesn't have to be in Python. This doesn't have to be in any language. You should be able to understand for each unsorted element, for j equals the last sorted down to zero, if move. This is your basic pseudocode algorithm. So understanding that is really, really important. At this point, we're going to give you our insertion sort demo. We're going to copy and paste our bubble sort demo. Um, we're going to copy and paste our, in, our bubble sort demo into here for some of our class information because we're just going to change the algorithm, um, which is going to change a couple of things inside of it. So let's go look at our bubble sort demo. Well, we're going to want our display. We already know we want that. So let's go copy our, our display. And we'll come put that in there. So that's going to be hanging out. Um, actually, I don't want it inside of my main. I want it outside. Sorry about that. Okay. So we've got our display method. 
What else can we take from our bubble sort? Well, we can take everything that does the first part. So this is all making our array. Don't forget we need to add in our scanner class. So we can import that. Now, we can go back over to our bubble sort. Our bubble sort has a for loop here that is going to run through it. That's what we're going to be changing. So we're going to change it so that it does insertion sort rather than bubble sort. And then finally, we'll have our input close. So I can go ahead and copy that one and make sure we put our input close at the end. Okay, so here's where I'm going to be putting my insertion sort. Okay, when we do our insertion sort, we are going to do things a little different than we did with our bubble sort. We are going to be using a temp file to hold on to um, a value. We're going to set B equal to the value that's before that, and then we're going to be doing some switching if they need to be switched. So we're going to be taking the value and inserting it into the place that it belongs. Remember, when we do insertion sort, it's a little different than bubble sort. We're not bubbling a value to the end. We're picking up a value and we're inserting it where it belongs. So let's go ahead and look at this code. We're going to set A equal to 1. And we're going to do a while loop. As long as A is less than some number's length, we're going to keep going. So we're going to do this multiple times. We're going to set our temp equal to our sum number is A. So whatever the value is that's in the first position when we start, remember the first position, not the zeroth position. We're going to start with the first position. And we're going to set B equal to A minus 1. So B is now equal to 0 because we just started with A as 1. B is equal to A minus 1. While, now we're going to move around. While b is greater than or equal to 0, and some nums um, position b, whatever the value is that's in b, is greater than temp. So if we're in a position where the 0 position is greater than um, our temp value, then we need to do some switching. So we're going to set some nums b plus 1 is equal to sum nums b. So we're going to flip those two, switch those two around. And we are going to decrement our b. So we're just going to see about that. Now at this point, when we decrement our b, it's going to go down to um, z uh, below 0. It's going to go down to negative 1, and it'll break us out of this loop. So the first time, we're only going to do one step. Second time, we can do more steps, and so on and so forth. After that loop, we need to reset some nums b plus 1, which is a little bit confusing now because we just decremented our b. So essentially, we're looking at the 0 position in this, in this case equal to our temp value. Finally, we're going to display again some nums at iteration a, and we're going to increment our a. Now, one of the things I want to do just to make these a little bit easier than the, um, the code is going to give it to you, I'm going to go ahead and add in some more print statements here. So our first move, we are going to take our 45 here and move it to the front. The next, we are going to take our 72 and move it to where it needs to be, between 82 and 72 and 45. So our 72 will end up here. Next, we're going to move our 18. Where does he go? He is going to go all the way to the front. And finally, we're going to move our 64. He is going to move in between our 45 and our 72. And we've essentially picked up each number and moved it to the position that he belongs in. So each time we went through, we inserted the value, the next value in the array to where he belonged. 
we refer to the efficiency of our sorting algorithm as big O notation. So we use an, a capital O, that's where it comes from. So our capital O, and it's our level of efficiency, how long does it take to run? In some situations, if you have enough memory and you have a fast enough processor, you may not care about your efficiency, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't be aware of it. If there are no loops, if you are just running a procedural code, we call it just big O with a constant. So it's constant um, uh, efficiency. However many lines of code is how many ever many lines of code you're gonna run. However, once we start introducing loops, now we can introduce constant or, or I'm sorry, we can introduce linear or logarithmic depending on what kind of search that we're gonna do. If we have a nested loop, we're going to have an n squared, or if you can fix the efficiency a little bit, you can have an n log n, which is a little bit better efficiency than a regular n squared. You can see from here that our least efficient sorting algorithms are technically our bubble and insertion sort, which are the two that we just showed you. That doesn't mean you shouldn't do um, other types of searches, binary searches, linear searches. These can be different options, but it helps when it comes to sorting to do um, the bubble and insertion are the easiest for you to understand. There is also a quick sort, an emerge sort, heap sorts, things like this, which help you to make your sorting algorithm a little bit more efficient. With your bubble sort, you can increase the efficiency by taking into account that your end item is already sorted because we're pushing things to the end every time you can actually decrease it by one, which can change it from n squared to n log n makes it a little bit more efficient. You can do the same type of thing with insertion sort. When you're sorting objects, okay, so at this point all of our sorting has been based on integers, based on numbers. You can sort objects and it's important because you're probably going to want to sort objects when you get into other projects and other assignments. So if I had an employee and I wanted to sort them by last name, I can do a sorting algorithm where the thing that I compare, so I can have an array or a list that is going to hold all of my employees. I can then compare last names, is this last name greater than or less than this last name, using string comparisons. I can use get salary to get the salary number from that employee inside that. But you're gonna have to build your code around the type that you're using. When you're using a class that is not a primitive type, you need to understand what is the piece of data that's coming out. If the piece of data is an object, I can't compare objects directly. I have to throw in an object dot get salary, object dot get last name, object dot something, get some value from there so I can do the comparison. If I have a get ID, I can do comparisons on the ID value if that's a number, but I can't just do employee greater than or equal to employee. That's not gonna work correctly. So it's important to recognize how you would sort if you had objects. You can choose to make your array two-dimensional. You can also make it more dimensionals than that. But two-dimensionals are the easiest to visualize on a screen while I'm explaining it to you. So we can think of a matrix. A matrix has both rows and columns. And in the examples that we've done here, we can have a one-dimensional array, which is the ones that we've been talking about. We can have a two-dimensional array where we simply say integer and then two sets of square brackets. The two sets of square brackets as opposed to one set will give us our row, and then our row will have columns. You can choose to have all of your rows have the same number of columns. That's doable. So I could say my number of rows is going to be three. I'm going to have three rows. And my number of columns is going to be four. In this case, I have four columns in each of my three rows, and I have a standard two-dimensional array. In Java, two-dimensional arrays can have ragged arrays, which is where each row as an array can have different lengths. You can choose to have row one have only three columns and row two have five columns if you want to. It's called a ragged array because if you line them all up as a matrix, they don't balance nicely. They're kind of ragged. The ends are, are not straight. They don't line up. But you can do it. As long as you visualize in your head, each row is essentially a second array. We have an array of arrays, which is how you can do a third level. 
if you wanted to do an array of arrays and each item inside of that array is another array, that's an option. So you can have multi-dimensional arrays being able to add items to the array and move them around. We're going to do a quick you do it on page 436 of just a two dimensional array, a three by three, where the user is going to enter a single row and column. When you enter the row and column, it's going to increment. So we're going to increment the row and column every time the user enters it. We're going to do some validation to make sure that you entered a good choice. And we're going to print out and use a display method every time you enter a new, a new item to show you what the array looks like. We're now going to explain to you a um, two-dimensional array and walk you through how to do it. In this case, we're going to use our two-dimensional array demo. We're going to do our public static void main, and we're going to build our two-dimensional array. In this case, we're going to use integers, so we're going to do a two-dimensional array with integers. Open and close brackets for each, and we're going to call it count. It's going to be a new two-dimensional array that's going to be a three by three. So we're going to go ahead and set it to a three by three array. Um, at this point, I can go ahead and declare a um, scanner for my input of my different array. Um, and the scanner is just, we're just going to continually ask the user for each column and row, what do you want to enter? So let's make our variables, our scanner input equals new scanner. Let's import him and then we'll make an integer row and column. And we'll have a final int that is our quit sentinel, and we'll set him equal to 99. Okay, let's go ahead and ask the user to enter which row does he want to enter values in. So assist out. We're going to say um, enter a row or quit. To quit. We're going to let the row equal the input next int. Now we know what row we're working on. While row is not equal to quit, our system out, we're going to go ahead and say enter a column. and let the user enter the column. So column equals input next int. Did I just do column? I just, I, I just run column instead of column. There we go. And we're gonna say if our row is less than our count dot length and our column is less than our count row, whichever row we're in, dot length. Then our count row and our count column is going to be equal to whatever number they entered. Um, actually, we're just going to increment it. So you'll be able to see whichever one they entered is going to start with a one and then it's going to move up to a two if they enter it again. So our row and our column. So what we did is we made sure that we weren't out of bounds. We didn't get our row or column too high or too low. Now that we've done that, we're going to go ahead and um, So after the user has done that and we're good, we're going to go ahead and print out 
our um, entire array. I'm actually going to build a method for this because I like methods for this. Public static void um, display. And we're going to use a two dimensional int array called array. And inside here, we're going to go ahead and do our for loop int i equals zero. i is less than array dot count. I'm sorry, array dot length. And i plus plus. Then we'll do our second level. For int j equals zero, j is less than array i dot length. So how many columns are available? Uh, j plus plus. And then we'll print out sys out. Um, and we're just going to print the values and put a space in. So count i j. Oops. And then we'll add um, a space in there. Finally, after we've printed each row, I'm sorry, array, not count. After we've printed a row, we're going to go ahead and do a single line um, just so we can go down to the next row. So we printed each row. So now we have our display method that we've done for those. And I can just come here after I have added um, or incremented. I can go ahead and display my array. If the user gave me a valid, an invalid position, I need to do an else. So then I can do a sys out um, invalid position selected. Okay. Now we have added our value and at the end of our loop, we can prompt the user for another value. Since we already have this here, I'm going to go ahead and copy it. And we can go ahead and paste it down here. So we're going to go ahead and say, at this point, enter in a new row, if you want another row, or hit Q to quit. Now, in this case, we only are allowing the user to pick rows 0, 1, and 2, because we need to, to limit that at this point. Um, so let's go ahead and see if this does anything. All right, so we're going to enter in row zero, and we're going to enter in column one. So you can see it printed out my array and incremented column one. Let's go ahead and enter row one, and we'll do column two. So you can see I did that one. Row zero, column zero, row zero, column two, row zero, column one, and I've incremented that one more. So you can see how each time I do this, it's going to allow me to increment that value and be able to continue to work on this. When I'm all finished, I can hit 99 and it will break me out. There is an arrays class and this arrays class has some methods in it that might be useful for you. Using the arrays class, we can tell it to fill values. We can tell it to sort. We can tell it to um, do an, check an equals between two values. It's important when you use an arrays class method, though, that you understand what it is you're asking it to do. If you are doing an arrays sort on a list of integers, that should work just fine. It's primitive type and it'll work just fine. If you want to do an arrays sort on a class type, it's not going to work nicely. You're going to have to do some extra code to make it work. Not that it can't be done, just that you need to give it a comparator and different pieces of information. You can do a binary search, which is a more efficient search on your scores to find a specific entry. So if I wanted to find a score and I wanted you to tell me where is that score, you can do that with a binary search using the arrays method or the arrays class. The arrays class, you can also fill in all of a certain value into your array. One of my favorite methods in Java is the array list class. You may have noticed when we do arrays, you always have to know how many you have to start with. That's not 
feasible. That's not going to work in a lot of situations. You may not know how many you're going to have ahead of time, and you're not going to be able to hard code that in. In this situation, you can make an array list class, which is used to store objects instead of primitive types. It also will dynamically resize. You don't need to tell it at the beginning how big you want it to be. So I can put strings in there. I can put employees. I can put cars. I can put different objects inside of my array list, and it'll dynamically resize. When you use an array list, rather than an array, you, de you declare it just like a regular object, so array list, but you have to use angle brackets to tell it what the type is. It's very important that in your array list, they're all the same type. In the example here, we have an array list that is a string type. So everything I'm going to be adding into it is a string. I could make an array list of cars or an array list of employees, and these would be able to be the employee or car or class name, whatever it is, inside of those angle brackets. So the ones that look like greater than less than signs. You can declare a starting um, size for your array list, but you can choose not to if you don't want to. When you use your array list, you're going to use add, remove, and get. These are useful. Get and set, add and remove, and whatever the size is. It's not length for an array list, it's size. It's different because it wants to know how many are actually filled in, not how big did it make the, the temporary storage. We're going to use the new keyword, obviously, to initialize. When you add, you can add an individual object or you can add an individual object at a specific point. So I can choose to say add to my employee where two is the position that I want it to go in. I can remove items at a specific position. I can get the item at a specific position and then it will return that object. And I can set the specific object into a certain item as well. The last thing is the size. It's really important to remember array lists use size and not length. The collections class has a, or the collections library class, um, has a class method to sort items that are in an array list. An array list is of type collections, so it can use the collections class method. But again, just like with trying to sort objects with regular arrays, you do need to add a little bit of extra code to be able to make your sort work right. I'm now going to do a quick array list demo just because I think array lists are important enough to justify their own demo. Um, array lists are really, really important if you do not know ahead of time how many items are going in your um, array. And I think it's important enough to justify doing a, a demo just for the array list. So let's go ahead and make our array list. And we're going to give him um, of type string. Now, at this point, he's going to want me to um, add the library for array list, so that's important. We're going to do new array list of type string open close. It's really important to get the um, brackets, the um, angled brackets for your type. So we need to know the type. Do I spell string wrong? Um, oh, I need to give a variable name. Sorry. <laughs> Names. So there we go. Um, so our new array list, and it has a type of string. So everything that belongs in there is a string, and it is an array list. But I didn't have to tell it how big it wanted to be. Now I can do names.add Mary. Names. Um, names add John, and let's go ahead and build ourselves a display method. So public static void display, and it's going to take an array list of type string, and we're going to call it ARR. And inside here, I'm going to say what the size is. And I can use arr.size to use our size method. And then we're going to do a loop. R is less than arr size. R plus plus. And inside of there, we're going to print out what the position is and what the name is. 
So let's this out. We're going to do position. Whoops. Position. And we're going to print it out um, I. So we know what position they're in. Comma, name. And we'll print the name. Plus ARR get. And we're going to use X. Um, I'm sorry, we're going to use I for our iterator. Sorry. Okay, so we can print out the position. Just to have that nice little display method in there. So let's go ahead and we'll add Mary and John and then we'll display our names. And let's add a few more. Names, um, Debbie, whoops, names, add, Debbie, Names dot add Ryan and we'll display again. Okay. Now we can remove a few of these names. So let's see here if we did names dot remove. We can remove at a specific index. So let's remove Mary, that first name that we added. So we're going to remove Mary here, and um, let's display one more time. And finally, we will do a names um, set at position zero, and we're going to call this one um, Catherine. And let's display our names again. Make sure that we understand everything that's going to occur here. So when we run, let's go look and see what happened. Whoops. There we go. Okay, so first we got Mary and John, which is exactly what we expected. And it was a size of two. Now the size is four. We have Mary, John, Ryan, and Debbie. Perfect. Those are in order. Now we're going to remove zero, which was at position zero was Mary. Everything else bumped up. So John is now in position zero. So when we assigned Catherine to position zero, she overrode John. And now we have Catherine, Debbie, and Ryan. So you can see how we can use the add, remove, and set methods and get methods. So these are a lot of methods that you can use with your array list to be able to push things in, pull things out. Sometimes when you're working with data, you want to make sure that things are always referenced exactly as you want them. There's a select list of possible values, fixed list of values, such as days of the week, months of the year, month names, um, things like this. So we like to make things that are enumerations so that the user only has a subset of possible values to play with. Enumerations are great. Rather than making an entire class for the months, I can just make a quick enumeration called month, and it only has 12 values. The user has to pick from those 12 values. He can't pick anything else if I make his object, his variable, of type month. Same thing with days of the week if you wanted to do that. Couple of the methods we can play with, with enumerations, the value, the two string, ordinal, which gives its position in the list. If you wanted to refer to these by position, you can get the ordinal. You can also compare them with equals and um, use compare to with greater than or less than to give you a value of positive or negative. Let's look at some enumerations just to get you that visual of what they do. All right. At this point, we're gonna do the enumeration. You do it on page 454. We're gonna do this one for two different reasons. First, I want to remind you how to do classes because you're gonna need them probably for your midterm, but essentially you're gonna to need to remember how to do classes. So I wanna reiterate how to do classes. First thing we're gonna do um, is create an enumeration. We're going to call it uh, color and it's going to enumerate our um, colors for our car class that we're going to be building. So we're going to be opening a new file and we're going to be calling that color.java and this is going to be an enumeration. So instead of a class, I'm going to do an enumeration and it's called color. We are going to say enumerate color and it is going to be black, comma, blue, green, whoops, comma, red, white, and yellow. 
These are our enumerations for our color. We're then going to make a secondary enumeration for our model. What kind of model do we want to have? So I'm going to do a new file and I'm going to say model.java and we are going to make the model enumeration. In this one we are going to say sedan comma convertible and minivan. I'm going to put truck in there too because that just seems wrong. Okay, so those are our models. Um, what type of models do we want for our car? Okay, now we're going to make our car class. So we're going to come up here and we're going to make our car class. Car.job. This is going to be a class. But inside of our car class, we're going to have some private methods or some private variables, fields. So our private is going to be what year is it? And that's going to be an integer. We are going to have a private type of model. And it's going to be our model. And we are going to have a private color. Okay. Now we can go ahead and make our constructor. So our public car, remember how to make a constructor. It's going to take a year, a model, and a color. So when we do our demo, we're going to be filling in those values specifically. And we're going to say year equals yr, model equals m, and color equals c. So that's our base constructor. Now we're going to have our um, display. Void display. And in this case, he is going to do a system out. And he is going to print car is a year plus space space color space and model. So we're going to get the text for each of those values and that's going to work just fine for our display. So let's save that and let's go make our car demo. Car demo dot job. In our car demo, this new class he is going to be a main and inside of our main we're going to have our car is the first car and he is going to equal a new car, parentheses, okay, 2014. And his model is going to be a minivan, and his color is going to be black. Car, second car. It's gonna be a new car. We are gonna make him a 2020 convertible, and his color is gonna be red. And you can see how um, IntelliSense was able to fill in those values just nicely. Next, I'm going to display both. First car display and second car display. When I run this demo, assuming all goes well, car um, is a 2014 black minivan and a 2020 red convertible. So we were able to use those enumeration types that we did to allow us to print out what the types of cars are and be able to use specifically those enumerations. Enumerations are great. They help you to, to really keep things straight. Couple of reminders with arrays. First off, if you have a two-dimensional array, the first subscript is always the row, the second is always the column, if you're visualizing it as a two-dimensional array, as a matrix. If you're going to start going down the three and four, calling them rows and columns doesn't really work anymore. You don't store primitive types in array lists. I know you'd like to, but you don't. Array lists are for objects, so we can do strings, we can do objects, but we don't store primitive types in array lists. And enumerated constants are not strings. We don't have to use quotes when we use enumerated constants. We just type in the text, whatever the text happens to be. They are not strings. They are enumerated constants and are treated as their own type. They are not a string type. Hopefully this gave you a little bit more information about arrays. Please come back next time for chapter 10. Have a great week.